everybody. Good morning. Uh, so how you feeling about this weather? Oh, wow. I, I like a lot of woohoos there. I'm a little surprised. A little kind of mixed reviews, right? Um, so in case you're wondering, like some of you know, I'm, I'm from, when you guys say up north, I don't feel like it's north, you know, but everything's north of here, right? So Springfield, Missouri is kind of home base for me. I was born in Illinois, grew up in cold and snow and all that stuff. But I haven't lived there since like 1999. And that is all out of my blood at this point. And so I'm all about warm weather. And I, I like, you know, what we normally experience here. Though, I'm happy for the break. This is good. I hope it's gone in a week, you know. Uh, get back to normal. Not really. It's all good. Whatever God brings is good, right? Because God is good all the time. Anyway, um, everybody enjoy an extra hour of sleep last night? Did you get that in? Right? I don't want to see anybody falling asleep then this morning. All right? If so, I guess that's on me, probably not on you. So um, we're going to be in James chapter 4. James chapter 4, uh, we're going to continue our study here in our series called Faith Works. We're working through the book of James. Got a few more weeks to go to get through the end of chapter 5. But uh, Faith Works, and the idea being what? I think you know this, if you've been with us for a little bit, that if you are a follower of Jesus, you have faith in Christ, then your faith must be, what, working its way out, right? And, and James would say, if, if your faith is not evident, right? In other words, if your life doesn't demonstrate your faith, then James would say, and this is not me, this is James, he would say, you're deceiving yourself, right? And by the way, when I say James, it's like the Holy Spirit of God working through him. So God would say, you really need to examine your life if somehow you say you have faith, but it's not working its way out. So that's why we've titled this series, Faith Works, because that's kind of what he emphasizes all the way through, right? Uh, faith in Jesus should make a difference in our lives. And so uh, that's, that's what we've been talking about. Over the last couple of weeks, we've been in, I'll call it a mini-series, right, called The Fight Club. And, and we've been talking about what it would look like for us to fight better against our flesh and against the enemy, but then at the same time fight less with each other and with God. And, and both of those things are commanded of us in Scripture. And so we have been talking about principles that we find here in James chapter 4 that will help us to do that. Fight less and fight better all at the same time. And so uh, if you missed the last couple of weeks, I'm going to catch you up today. Here's what we talked about first. And, and James begins this in James 4 verse 1. He says, where do wars and fights come from among you? And as you read through scripture, you find out as long as there have been humans, there has been fighting, right? And sometimes fighting in the form of an argument, sometimes fighting in the form of, you know, wars, literally, and, and everything in between. Where does that come from? And, and what, we, what we said was, look, as followers of Jesus, we should just expect conflict. Now, we're not going to accept conflict as normal in our lives, but we do need to expect it, right? God desires that we be in unity with him, in fellowship with one another, and as much as is possible, that as far as it depends on us, we should live at peace with all men, the scripture says. And so we're working at that, but at the same time, we know that the reality of living in a sinful world with sinful people, including each one of us, uh, then we're just going to expect. Because if we expect conflict, we can be kind of prepared for it, right? And we can better deal with it and resolve it in a way that's godly, in a way that's holy, in a way that's going to please and honor uh, the Lord. And so that was the first principle. If you just expect it uh, to be a part of life, then we can be prepared for it and respond appropriately. So then the second principle of our fight club, as we're calling it, is to look within yourself first. In other words, when you have conflict, whether that's maybe at home with a spouse or a parent or a child, uh, maybe it's at work, maybe it's at school, wherever you would find yourself in conflict, what Scripture is going to encourage us to do is first look within ourselves to figure out what we need to do right why well he goes on in verse one where do wars and fights come from among you do they not come from your desires for pleasures that war in your members he's saying hey you need to look at you first before you start pointing fingers at someone else and, and putting blame elsewhere look inside because almost always when we're in a conflict at, at least part of the reason for that conflict is because um there's something in me that i want and, and it's it's welling up I want something to happen, and it's not happening, and so therefore, I'm doing things to con contribute to so conflict in some way. Now, now it, you know, I already read, I kind of cited Romans. It says, 
as much as lies within you, as much as it's possible, you live at peace with all men. There may be times where the conflict, it, it's, it's coming from one direction and it's not going back from you. Uh, that's rarely the case. We almost always have a piece of that, especially when it's, you know, personal conflict. And so James says, hey, make sure you look within yourself. There's probably something going on in there that has to do with your lustful thinking or desires, things that you desire to have but you don't have, and you're trying to get that, and that's creating or at least contributing to the conflict. So look within yourself first if we want to resolve the fighting and conflict that maybe we're in. And then the third principle, and this was as far as we got last week, was just talking about this one principle, was to humble yourself before God. And we actually saw that in verse 7, where he said, Therefore, in light of all of these things, submit yourself to God. And then he went on and kind of rattled off, including that one, 10 commands to believers that will, um, you know, that should be our proper response once we've examined ourselves to the conflict that we're in. Whether we're fighting against God or other people, or maybe it's just with, within our own self, a spiritual battle that's taking place there. Humble yourself before God. And we see this in verses 7 down to verse 10. In fact, in the end, verse 10, he also says there, um, you know, to humble yourself in the sight of the Lord and he will lift you up. So he sort of sandwiches, you know, bookends, 10 commandments there. And those are the things that we looked at last week. If you missed that, I would encourage you to go back um, in our church app or on our website or on our YouTube page. You can go back and, and find those things and kind of get all caught up. So, uh, but I mentioned to you last week that one of those 10 commands, I felt like we just needed to spend a little bit more time on. So that's where we're going to begin today. And Lord willing, we'll get through principle four and number five and kind of wrap up this section of, of our study of this letter that James wrote um, by looking at those today. And, and it's this. In fact, if you'll look at verse seven again, we're going to look at the second half of that, and then we'll jump down to verses 11 through 12 to kind of wrap it up today. But here, Scripture says again in verse 7, James chapter 4, Therefore, submit to God, resist the devil, and he will flee from you. So that's the fourth principle when it concer as it concerns resolving conflict or the fighting uh, that we experience, and that is to resist the devil or resist our enemy. And this is so critical to the battle that we're in. And I hope you understand, you are in a battle. How terrible would it be to be in a battle, but only you didn't know it, right? Just everybody else knew it. How well do you think you're going to do in that battle if you don't even know what's going on? Well, I can tell you, you're going to lose, right? And, and this is why we're being prepared. And that's why God prepares us in Scripture. So Scripture teaches us very clearly that we have an enemy. And what we're told here is submit to God. We talked about that last week. And then resist, resist the devil. So here's what the scripture says. It has a lot to say about our enemy. But it says this, that he is the God of this world. And when I say that, I mean little g. Let me show you that in 2 Corinthians chapter 4. And it'll pop up on the screen. If you're taking notes, you can just jot the reference down. You can see it there. Or if you want to turn in your Bible and, and see it with me, 2 Corinthians chapter 4. We're going to read verses 3 and 4. Here's where scripture says this. But even if our gospel is veiled... Paul, obviously, writing this letter to the church at Corinth. If our gospel is veiled or kind of hidden, it's not seen very well, it is veiled to those who are perishing. So he's talking about people that don't know the Lord yet, which means they're perishing. Like if they die without knowing the Lord, they will spend eternity in hell separated from him. Of course, we don't want that for anybody. And so we pray and work to make disciples, followers of Jesus, so that they won't experience that kind of perishing forever, so to speak. But he says, if it's veiled, if the good news that they don't have to remain in that state, if it's, if it's hidden or veiled, it's from those who are perishing. But then he says in verse 4, whose minds, those who are lost, they don't know Jesus yet, their minds, he says, are uh, the God of this age has blinded, who do not believe. The God of this age. Notice, it's little g, right? It's, it's not God, the God of heaven. The God that we love and praise and serve and honor that we just sang about. No, it's not that God. It's the God of this age or the God of this world. And he is identified as our enemy, as, as Satan. He's called by name, you know, Satan or the devil. Uh, the scripture says in Ephesians chapter 2, verses 1 to 3, that the devil, our enemy, is not only the God of this age. He is the prince of the power of the air. And that's kind of a mouthful, right? Ephesians chapter 2, verses 1 to 3 says, and you... He made alive. God made you alive. If you have come into a faith relationship with Jesus, 
You have been made alive. Why is that so important? Because you were dead in your trespasses and sins. Spiritually, you were dead, but now he says you've been made alive. Watch what it says in verse 2. In which you once walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, the spirit who now works in the sons of disobedience. Talking about those that don't know the Lord yet. Verse 3. Among whom also we all once conducted ourselves in the lusts of our flesh, fulfilling the desires of the flesh and the mind, and were by nature children of wrath, just as the others. Boy, so many things to, to catch here. One, the prince of the power of the air. Do, do you ever like look at the world, maybe read the news, and feel like, man, there is some powerful, there's some powerful things going on, and they're not good. They're not good at all. In fact, I mean, mostly what you get from the news is that. You watch the news around the world, so much bad, so much negative, so much violence, so much death, uh, so much evil and wickedness, and you, and you realize there is something going on here. There is something in operation, and what Scripture says is it's the prince of the power of the air. There is a power, and it is evil and is wicked, and it sort of dominates the world that we live in, and it's the God of this age, the God of this world, who is sort of ruling and dominating. And, and again, if you ever doubted that, all you have to do is just kind of open your eyes. I got, right? The devil voice came out, didn't it? Sorry about that. He is the prince of the power of this mic sometimes. I don't, I don't quite get it. Um, but, but, you know, like, like it's real. Like, just like that was real. Like, it's in operation. And you see that. And, and man, uh, it can be very discouraging at times. And, and I was going to say, like, like, if you doubt that, just open your eyes. Look around. It is very obvious that the God of heaven is not like in control of most of our lives. And, and what I mean by that is like in the way that we are yielding to him, right? Most of the world is not living in, in accordance to and in obedience to and, and, and like, like patterning their lives after the way that Jesus lived and what he's described for us, right? Otherwise, this would be a very different world that we live in, unfortunately. And, and, and the reality is that there is an evil, an evil person, the devil, Satan. Uh, he has lots of different names in the Bible, and he's the prince of the power that's operating particularly in and through those who don't know Christ yet. And that seems very evident. Um, before coming to Christ, and, and, and I hope you get this, because, you know, uh, Paul's very clear to say this, uh, but don't be too quick to judge others, right? And, 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 like, think highly of yourself as one who's not one of those. Because he says, oh, by the way, like, you were one of those. Remember that? Before you knew Jesus, that was you. We all walked that way. We all walked contrary to Jesus and, and his ways. We all walked according to the course of the world that is being run and dominated by the prince of the power of the air. So we were all there. So he's saying, he's not saying any of that to judge anyone out there. He's saying, hey, first of all, be thankful that you have now been made alive in Jesus. Amen? That's good news. Uh, and you're walking in a different direction, and your life should demonstrate that because we were all spiritually dead in our trespasses and sins. In fact, Scripture says, uh, do you remember when Jesus was talking to some Pharisees? And he said to them, you are of your father the, remember who? The devil, right? They were hypocrites. They were walking contrary to Christ. They, they pretended to be spiritual. And, and maybe they were in some ways, but it wasn't the spirit of God that was directing them. It was a different spirit, the spirit of the air, the spirit of the power of, of Satan himself, I think. And so he says that you are of your father the devil. Listen, uh, as, as terrible as that news sounds, that was all of us, right? Before knowing Jesus, the truth of Scripture is that our spiritual father is not the father in heaven. Our spiritual father is the devil himself. And so James is saying, hey, look, fighting, it comes from within your heart. There are things going on there. You need to battle that. But you need to submit yourself to God and also resist the devil because his desire is not good for you and it's not good for this world. As believers, Scripture says that um, the enemy continues to come against us. He is like a roaring lion seeking whom he may, what? Devour, Devour right? First Peter chapter 5 and verse 8 tells us that. Do you know that he is more powerful than any human being? Do you know? Like, like there's not, it's not a contest, right? He is more powerful than anyone in this room. Should that scare you? Well, that should scare you if you think you're going to resist him or come against him in your power alone. Um, not even Michael the archangel did that. If you read the book, the little letter from Jude, right before Revelation, 
It says that Michael and, and the devil, they got into an argument <laughs> and, and over the body of Moses. Man, go and chew and figure that one out for a little while, right? And, and, and so, so they're in this argument, so to speak, and it says that Michael did not even dare to rebuke him, but only in the name of the Lord, right? No, even Michael wasn't going to come ag against him in his own power, in his own pride, in his own wisdom, because he is more powerful than any human being. But the scripture would teach us that when we humble ourselves before God, and when we say humble ourselves before God, that's repentance, and that's confession, and that's walking in obedience to Christ. Check this out. Though he is more powerful, he has no power over you as you walk in Jesus. Right? Does that make sense? He's more powerful than you, yes, uh, if you come against him alone. But in Christ, he is a defeated foe. He has no power over you in Christ as you walk in obedience to him. As Christians, the scripture tells us that we are called to take up what's called the armor of God in Ephesians chapter 6. And we are to stand against our enemy. Remember it says, and, and having done everything, taking up this armor, you stand against him. And in James he's saying, if you will submit to God, you put on the armor of Christ, and then, or the armor of God, then you stand against him, and he will, he'll flee from you. He will run away. He wants to devour you, but he has no power against you in Christ. Now here's what we have to make sure we get. That um, personally and collectively, the victory has already been won. Right? He is defeated in your life. Now, make no mistake, we are in a battle. And the way that I usually say it, we're in a battle for the glory of God and for the souls of men, right? The, Satan wants to prevent us and the world from bringing glory to Christ. And he's doing what he can to blind the minds of those who don't see Jesus so that they will miss eternity with him forever. There is a battle for the glory of God and the souls of men in your life and in this world. But you, in Christ, can be victorious. And we collectively, as the church, whether that's this local church or collectively as a body of believers, victory is ours in the Lord. Uh, Jesus said that the church belongs to him, right? And, and he also said, the gates of hell shall not prevail against us in Matthew chapter 16. In other words, if we will follow after Jesus to accomplish his purposes in his wisdom, in his strength, and in his power, then the enemy cannot prevent God's purposes from being accomplished. That's good news. And that's true in your life individually, and it's true of us collectively. Um, I hope you hear that as good news. So what does this mean then? If we go back to James, and he says, submit yourself to God and resist the devil. I want to share with you just for a few minutes biblically, like what would it look like then to resist the devil? Practically speaking, what, what does that mean? What do I need to be doing? What do I need to be thinking? How do I need to be behaving? What's that going to look like so that I actually can stand up and resist him and, and see him flee and there will be victory in my life? Again, personally and then also collectively for the glory of God. What's it look like? I'm, gonna give you, I'm just going to list off several things. Maybe you can jot them down. We're not going to go to all these verses. Uh, that will be for you to do later. But it first of all looks like resisting the devil. First of all, it looks like you confessing Christ as your Lord and Savior. Why is that? Because again, apart from Jesus, you have no power. In fact, he is completely powerful over you uh, apart from Christ. But in Christ, you confessing Jesus as Lord and Savior makes all the difference in the world. Because you go from being a child of the enemy to being a child of God, right? You switch families spiritually. The Bible would say you move from being a part of the kingdom of darkness to being a part of the kingdom of of light and so confessing Christ as your Savior is the first step in resisting the enemy where you jump by faith out of his family into the family of God by his grace and by his love being transformed in your mind by God's truth is another way for you to practically resist the enemy our natural tendency right humanly speaking is gonna drift towards sinfulness and evil and wickedness you experience that right I mean, that's, that's the way that we go naturally. Um, if you've raised children, you've watched that happen, right? They're just kind of naturally evil, right? You agree with me? Like, like, like I mean, you remember that, right? If you, you remember little kids. They naturally are just going to be mean and selfish, and, and they're going to, like, terrorize the world. And so we're trying to train them up to not be 
like human terrorists, right? They're going to terrorize the world because they're following who? They're following the prince of the power of the air. Like we all did that. And so what we're trying to do is let them see the glory of Christ in us and desire that and have a taste for that. And hopefully by the grace of God come to faith in Jesus and become a part of his army. Um, But part of that means that over time and as God continues to work in us after we've confessed him as our savior that we be come transformed in our minds by God's truth. Romans chapter 12 says that we're to lay our lives down as living sacrifices and not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of our mind. And this is a a daily and a constant practice of taking in God's truth into our lives and allowing it to transform our minds, lest we naturally drift and tend in a direction that we know is is contrary to God's purposes for us and in a sense sort of opens the door for the enemy to have influence in our lives in ways that um, certainly are not appropriate for a Christian Uh, walking in the spirit in obedience to God's word it's not just that you would take God's word in but it's that then you would make decisions and adjust your life so that now you begin to obey the things that God says because you believe that those things are good and right and true and healthy and holy. And, and so in Galatians chapter 5, it says, walk in the spirit and you shall not fulfill the lusts of the flesh, right? We have this natural tendency to drift in a wrong direction. But as we saturate our hearts and minds with God's truth and we determine to walk in them and obey them, you can't obey God and Satan at the same time. Right? And so you find yourself, the more you saturate your mind with his word, the spirit of God is working in you, and the more you obey him, the less that you are following the course of the world. And you are resisting the desire that Satan would have to have you walk contrary to the glory of God. That's one of the ways that we resist him, is simply by not obeying him, but instead obeying the spirit and the word of truth. Sharing the gospel with those who are lost is another way to resist the enemy because what is he doing he's wanting to blind their minds so that they don't see the light of the glory of the gospel of jesus christ and so we have been commissioned we have this treasure in us scripture says and in ephesians chapter 6 when it's describing the armor of god that we would use to stand against the enemy it's talking about things like faith and and righteousness and one of the things it says that we're to put on our feet as it sort of you know, in a very picturesque way, is describing the armor. It says that our feet would be shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace. In other words, that everywhere we would be going, we would be speaking the gospel of peace. Peace with God and peace with others. In fact, that's exactly what we're talking about, right? Where do wars and fights come from among you? Fights within yourself, fights with others, and fights with God. Man, there are things in our heart that need to be transformed by God's spirit and by his word. And the gospel, the good news of Jesus is what frees us to walk in a way that honors him and defeats the enemy. Let me give you two more. Two more ways to resist the devil in your life. Uniting with other believers and encouraging your fellow soldiers in the faith. Ephesians chapter 4 and so many other places Paul talks about uh, to Timothy in his letter to him about how we are soldiers and we need each other, we fight together, we're not to injure each other and walk over each other. And those who are injured, we've got to come along and pick up and help and encourage and, and build up in the Lord. It says that we're to endeavor to keep the spirit of unity amongst ourselves. Why? Again, because the natural tendency is for us to separate, to divide, to injure one another. And the spirit of God is going to lead us to do the very opposite of that. To battle for unity amongst ourselves. Why? Because we can defeat better our enemy together than we can alone. Right? I mean, I mean, wouldn't you rather enter into a battle with an entire army behind you than by yourself? You're going to be much more successful. And it's one of the reasons, I think, why, why God knew this. Man, he created the church as a family of believers that can help us, that can help us win the victory that's already been won. I mean, Jesus already won it on the cross. In the meantime, we're supposed to just go in the strength and the power of the Lord, walking in obedience to his word and in victory over sin, preaching and sharing the gospel with others around us. And what happens? Others will choose to see Jesus and embrace him and accept him. Again, it's all by the grace of God 
because of his great love and mercy for us. And let me give you one more. When, when we're talking about defeating our enemy, living in practical victory as we resist the, the, the power of the enemy in our lives, um, would be to be praying for God to work powerfully in and through you to accomplish his purposes. Again, in Ephesians chapter 6, when Paul talks about the whole armor of God there, he ends by saying, praying always for us. In other words, all the time, put on the armor of God. But again, don't think that, man, you've got the armor and now you're just good to go. Like, like you're going to bring God into that, of course. You want him to go before you and behind you and around you. You're going in his name. And so we're praying that God would give us boldness, give us strength, give us wisdom, and give us power to be victorious in our lives. And God has given us everything we need. So let's, like, I want to hit the pause button here real quick, just for a minute. Um, when we think about resisting the enemy, my concern is that there are too many believers, and, and maybe that's you, and maybe at times it's me, that, that we sort of feel the opposite of everything we've just described. Like we, like we feel powerless, right? And I'm sure that there are people in the room that like you have been struggling with sin or a particular sin, maybe some kind of addiction, some, something in your life that you have felt powerless against like like you've been carrying this with you uh, for years maybe even some of you for decades right and you feel like now you just got to learn to live with this thing because the enemy has some kind of you know power over you and you just haven't seen victory in that area listen i've just i want you to believe with everything in me what what god is teaching us that you can resist and you can stand against him and when you do he will run away from you he has already been defeated he is more powerful than you yes alone but with jesus living in and through you he has to flee his word says if you will resist him submitting to god he will flee from you jesus is the power of god working in you to give you victory and, and strength in every single moment you got to believe that and you got to live that out practically so sometimes we become overwhelmed by this and pastor justin and i were talking about this and he kind of brought it to my attention as he was reading through the notes for this week he said alan i think you've got to share with them that sometimes like let's say you've had a decades long battle with some kind of you know sin in some way maybe nobody else knows maybe Maybe somebody close to you does, but it's just, like you've just carried it with you. And you're tired, right? Maybe you even just stopped fighting against that. You just sort of gave up. And, and, and as we were talking about this, and, and we agreed that like sometimes it can seem overwhelming. Like, like this thing is so big, it's been part of my life for so long, and, and, and we think like it's, it's just this long, drawn-out thing that, that how do we ever get victory over that? And, and, and he was telling me that someone had shared with him, and I've heard this before as well, and it's, and it's really true. I've said it. It, listen, the battle that we're fighting and the things that we've described when you resist the devil, you, you really don't have to win like this long, drawn-out, years-long war. You know what I mean? Like, like really, all you have to win is, is this moment right here, right now. You, you know what I'm saying? Like, like the next time that you're tempted to sort of step in the direction of that thing that you've been struggling with, or maybe it's not a lifelong thing. Maybe it's just day-to-day -day for you. But like, like you don't have to win the battle like 10 years from now. You know what I mean? All you have to do is be victorious right now. And so like when he comes and tempts you right now, all you have to do is, is like just start praying and, and just go, hey, you know what? In Jesus, this battle's already been won and I don't have to step in that direction. In fact, I, I, man, I'm just going to resist the enemy right now and I'm going to do this other thing. You know what I'm saying? Like, like, like it really is like that simple. It's a decision in that very moment. And, and, and Justin, man, he said something so good. He says, oftentimes what happens to us is like we fail in a given moment. And, and it's not that that battle even continues. It's just sort of we just drag that defeat with us like, like for days and weeks and months. And so we feel like defeated all this time when in fact we lost a moment, right? The battle's not over. We, we, we lost that moment. Listen, it, practically speaking, if you will put the word of God in your heart and mind, and as soon as you're tempted, you just begin to talk to God, and you make the decision based on God's truth to be obedient to him. In that moment, you don't have to worry about the next one, because in the next moment, you can do the exact same thing. 
but you will be encouraged because you found victory in that very moment. Does that make sense at all? Like, I'm just telling you, super, like, sometimes we just overcomplicate it. You just have to win that very moment. And, and here's what scripture says, you can, right? Because God says, there's nothing that has tempted you, but such as is common to man. And, and don't we believe that lie sometimes? Like, hey, nobody else really gets this. No one else is going through this. Everyone that sits around me in church, they're perfect. <laughs> right? Which is totally not true. And, and we think, man, I just can't do this. I've proven this over and over again. I can't do this. But the rest of the verse says, hey, you need to know that in that moment, in that moment of temptation, that moment of struggle, God makes a way of escape. Like, like the way out, it's right there. But you have to make that decision right then, right there. That's the battle you have to win. In your mind, that's where it begins, in heart. Right there, you win that battle, and then boom, victory's yours. And you're going to be stronger, and you're going to be encouraged, and then you're going to know, hey, I could do that again the next time that temptation comes upon you. Right? But guess what? If you don't do these, like if you're not confessing Christ as your Savior, you're already lost. Right? Like you won't make it. If you don't let the Word of God start to penetrate and saturate your heart and mind, like you don't have any defense, right? You don't have any armor. You've got to have this with you. Uh, the scripture says this is the sword of the Spirit. One of the interesting things about a sword when it comes to battle is it is both offensive and defensive, right? I mean, you need the sword of the Spirit. And in Ephesians 6, it says, which is the Word of God. You begin to put that in there, and then you make the decision, man, I'm going to obey Jesus in this very moment. And you'll find victory, you're resisting the devil, and he'll run away. And I, I, like, I was going to say, I promise you, it's not my promise, it's God's promise. You know, you just need to believe that and embrace that. Um, and when you fail, and you will sometimes, um, James chapter 5 tells us, and we'll get there in a few weeks, like, listen, talk to some people, get some help, have them praying for you, confess your faults one to another, so they can come alongside and your, your army of people around you can help you move forward in strength and in victory, all right? So, listen, believe this, embrace this, you can win, whatever that is. Man, give it to Jesus today. Be victorious in any given moment, and then you can do the same thing again, and you can do that over and over and over again. Humble yourself before God, resist the devil, and he will flee from you. Amen? Listen, it's true. All right, let me give you one more, and, and we'll be done uh, with this little mini-series, right? Uh, the last principle I want to share with you, James chapter 4, let's read verses 11 and 12, and we're just going to hit this real quick. Here's what it says. Do not speak evil of one another, brethren. He who speaks evil of a brother and judges his brother speaks evil of the law and judges the law. But if you judge the law, you are not a doer of the law, but a judge. There is one lawgiver who is able to save and to destroy. Who are you to judge another? So here's the last principle. We're talking about fighting, right? Fighting less and fighting better. Guard your tongue and your heart. Guard your tongue and your heart. Because a lot of times what fighting looks like, especially with others, is, man, we got stuff in our heart and it comes flying out of the mouth. And it doesn't resolve the conflict, it just contributes, like throwing gasoline on the fire, right? Um, and by the way, th this matter of evil coming out of our hearts and being spoken out of our mouths, it, this is a common theme in the New Testament. And God says over and over again, like he must have known our tendency, like just to spew ugliness out of our mouths. And so, I mean, over and over again, I'm going to share a few of them with you uh, because God did. 2 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 20 is one of the places where he says this. 2 Corinthians 12, 20. This is where Paul, and, and, and Paul's not really giving a, an instruction or a command here. He's basically saying, hey, here's my concern for you. 2 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 20. Before I fear lest when I come, I shall find you such as I wish, um, not such as I wish, that is, and that I shall be found by you such as you do not wish. That's like really confusing. But here's what he says. Let there be contentions, or lest there be contentions, jealousies, outbursts of wrath, selfish ambitions, backbitings, whisperings, conceits, tumults, all these kinds of things. He said, here's my fear, church at Corinth. And the church at Corinth, man, they really struggled. They had a lot going on and they, they had a hard time. And he said, here's my concern. Man, I've been preaching and teaching and sharing with you. My concern is I'm going to show up and you're not, gonna, you're not really going to be embracing this. You're just going to be letting all this stuff kind of spew out of your mouth. Uh, the stuff that comes out of your mouth, it's coming out of your heart, right? Ephesians chapter 4, he said the same thing to the church at, the church at Ephesus. Ephesians chapter 4, verse 31. 
He said, listen to this, let all bitterness, wrath, anger, clamor, and evil speaking be put away from you with all malice. He goes on to say, and be kind to one another, tender-hearted, forgiving each other. Like, get rid of all this mess, this stuff that, like, is in your heart and is being spewed out of your mouth. Like, that has to change. 1 Peter chapter 2, verses 1 to 3. 1 Peter chapter 2, and there's so many more, but obviously I just want you to see, like, over and over again, God says, 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 1, therefore, laying aside all malice, all deceit, hypocrisy, envy, and all evil speaking as newborn babes desire the pure milk of the word that you may grow thereby if indeed you have tasted that the Lord is gracious. Man, God is good and he's gracious, he's loving, and he is kind to us. That's what ought to fill our hearts and that's what should be coming out of our mouths. So when you stop and think about the last time you got into a conflict or a fight uh, that maybe turned into what looked like a war with your spouse or one of your kids or your parents or somebody at work, wherever that might have been, um, wasn't there a lot of stuff stirring in your heart that ended up kind of welling up and spewing out? And, and you said some things that, that Jesus would not have said. And certainly not in the way that you said them. You said things to injure and to do damage and to win. Not win a spiritual battle, but to win a war with a person. And the whole point that, that James is talking to us about is saying, man, those, those things ought not be as followers of Christ. So let's say, let's say you're someone, in fact, I don't, yeah, you just know in your own heart and mind, like, like maybe some of us would say, this is a problem for me, right? The stuff that comes out of my mouth gets me in trouble, right? Anybody like that in a room? Just smile at me, like some of you, right? Um, like that, we, we get in trouble from the stuff. What are we going to do about that? Right? What if we say, okay, this is a problem for me. M maybe it's, this is like your habit. Maybe this is just from time to time. How do you fix that? A and, and so, listen, to fix what comes out of your mouth, you have to fix what's in your heart. Because that's where it's coming from. Right? To fix what's coming out of here, you've got to fix what's going on inside of your heart. And we've kind of already talked about how to do that. First, man, we're going to repent before God. Right? We're going to confess our sin to him and confess our sin to others. And then we're going to fill our hearts with God's word. When you fill your hearts with God's word, guess what's going to happen? It's just going to fill and then it's going to overflow. And that's what's going to be coming out because that's what you're putting in there. You change your heart, you'll change what's pouring out of your mouth. And that's going to impact your relationships with people. And that's going to be the way that you're going to improve uh, and fix and resolve the conflicts and the fightings that are happening in your life. Uh, so here's what I'm going to give you. Like practically, what are you going to do with this? This week, then, this is it, right? Practically speaking, what are we going to do? And I'm going to challenge you and encourage you that when, as soon as you, this week, it'll happen to you. As soon as you feel like, I'm going to say just criticizing someone. I'm not going to say you're in a war with them. As soon as you feel like criticizing someone, start praying immediately and see if you can find instead a reason to either give thanks for them or to praise them. And, 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 like, don't give up on this too soon because it'd be really easy just to go, oh, man, there's nothing to give praise to them about. There's nothing to be thankful for them about, right? And in the moment, if you're in the flesh, I mean, that's, that's where you're going to want to go. But what I'm challenging you, the next time you, the thought comes to even be critical of someone else, pause, pray, and then see if you can find a reason. Standing before God to either be thankful for them for some reason or to, or to even praise them instead. A, a pr that will transform your life. It'll transform your marriage. It'll transform your relationship with your parents or maybe with a friend or, or someone else that you struggle with. Let, let's wrap this up, right? Really, just kind of conclusion. I feel like I want to tie all the last three weeks together, and here it is in, in a real quick summary. Where do wars and fights come from among you? This is what James says. Um, he says, okay, it's from the desires of your heart. There's, there's a war inside of you, and, and that is spilling out. And that's causing problems with other people, with God, and even within yourself. You haven't resolved that yet. So what are we going to do about those desires? What are we going to do? In other words, how can we fight better and how can we fight less? Here it is. If you miss the last three weeks, you're going to get caught up. Um, bump the person next to you. Wake them up. They can write this down and feel like they've been here, right? What are we going to do? Expect conflict. Look within yourself first. That's where you have to start. Humble yourself before God. Resist the devil. Victory is yours already. And then guard your tongue and heart. And your life will be transformed. And, and the lives of people around you will be transformed as well. Uh, I, I didn't read in Ephesians. We read verse 31. 
in, in verse 29, it talks about how no corrupt com communication should proceed out of our mouth, but only those things which are good for the use of edifying and building up others. Where is that going to come? That's going to come when you experience the grace and the peace and the joy and the salvation of the Lord. That is where we begin. Let's pray together. Father, thank you so much for your, your word of truth. And um, man, there's so much going on even, you know, concerning this topic and so much going on in this world, so much going on in our lives and, and in our hearts. And what we really need first is peace with you. Um, and I thank you for sending Jesus to do that, to bring us peace, peace with God first. Um, and we believe that as we have peace with you, then that peace will reign in our hearts and lives and we will begin to see victory in ourselves and that victory is going to flow out of us and in, in relationships with others and, and hopefully in a way that brings honor and glory to you but lord we're here to confess that that we need you we need you first and foremost and so lord we humble ourselves before you today asking you to help us and strengthen us and and build our relationships um, so that others can see christ living in and through us lord i pray that you would help us to do exactly what you say Guard our hearts, guard our minds, guard our tongues. Lord, um, without you, it's impossible, but with you, all things are possible. Lord, I pray that today you would give us victory, each and every one of us, wherever we're struggling. Lord, wherever we have struggled to submit to you, Lord, I pray that we would take whatever that is and, and lay it before you today and know that Jesus died to give us victory. Um, not so that we would be built up in our own pride, but so that others would see that you are real you make a difference you have a, a, a plan and a purpose for our lives not only in this lifetime but for all of eternity lord help us to to win just moment by moment the battles and the temptations that we face lord may the enemy flee from each one of us and free flee from this place may we walk in victory this week and in this month and this year so that others can see and know jesus because of what you're doing through us father we love you and thank you and praise you in jesus name amen all right.